Okay, so this is going to be my first <laughs> uh, YouTube video. I have never done this before. Um, so probably going to be a few hiccups, but I kind of plan on trying to do this as much as I can in the future. So I'm sure it'll get better as it goes. Um, so this first video I'm going to do is basically explaining how I get my drums to sound the way they sound um, in like, a, this is more of like a rock sense. I don't really actually have a track behind it. It's really just going to kind of be just drums. Um, but I'm going to start with blank drums minus like the edit and the cleaned up toms. As you can see, like I, I cleaned most of the bleed out of the toms, everything that isn't a tom hit got cleaned up and faded um but yeah these were recorded in our live room um i used a gretsch renown kit uh, i think a 24 inch kick drum um josh Manuel um tracked these uh so we used his signature snare it's a copper snare i think i'm not really sure on the size but it sounds really good um I have everything labeled here with what mics and whatnot I used. Um, and I can go over position when we get into it a little bit more. But um, essentially, I put a uh, Telefunken M82. Yeah, M82 inside the kick drum about halfway in, like pretty as close to dead center as I could. I didn't use any of the little switches on the mic because it just kind of winds up sounding weird to me. Um, and right on the outside of the resonant head, I used a uh, warm audio uh 47 junior um kind of just grab some low end nothing really near the hole I, I don't tend to really like the sound of a kick drum with a mic in just the hole like right on the hole it doesn't sound great to me um works for some people just doesn't really work for me the um i did one snare top mic but i actually molted it out in my patch bay and wound up hitting an 1176 with it um pretty slow attack fast release just trying to get a bit of snap out of it and i recorded that in parallel um so i have the dry track and the compressed track um snare bottom same telephone and m80 just facing the wires you know um two toms on this kit uh there was a ks a sure ksm 32 on both toms i really like that mic on toms when i have the ability i only have two of them so when i have the ability to just have a two tom kit i like to use them they sound really nice um and trusty sm7 on the hi-hat not really too close to the hi-hat a little bit far off from it if you get too close you get this weird like low mid woofy thing that i don't really like um the overhead was uh Cole's 4038s. They're really dark ribbon mics, but they sound really great for overheads. You can boost it a lot of top if you feel like you need it. A lot of times I don't feel like I need that. I kind of like a warmer overhead sound. Um, there was a, as far as room mics, there was a tube U47 um, behind the drummer, about probably like four or five feet behind the drummer facing the, the kick drum um, just to get a little bit more kick attack and a bit of snare body. Depending on the drum mix, I'll either decide, one of those will be in or out of phase. Uh, so I'll either decide to highlight the kick or highlight the snare. It just depends. Um, inside the drum room, we used a pair of uh, Bayer Dynamic M160s. I have two um, little four foot gobos that are absorptive on one side and reflective on the other. So I put the absorptive side uh, towards the drummer with both of them kind of spread evenly in the room and then put the M160s on the reflective side facing the gobo, which is also facing the drummer. Um, the hall mic, uh, right outside the live room, there's a nice hall. Um, I used two warm audio 414s in figure eight in a blum line position, so kind of making like an X um to get like a really nice stereo image um and those mics are pretty bright usually um but they, i feel like they did a good job and then here i also wound up doing the same thing i did on the snare drum where i 
multed those two mics out and in parallel recorded the compressed version of those going through uh, my Veramu compressor. Really fast attack, pretty long release, just really trying to get a lot of that like sustain out of it so I can blend it in. Um, and doing this, this was like the first time I ever did that with the parallel compression thing. It honestly really helped a lot. I'll probably wind up doing it a lot more in the future. Um, it just kept me from having to compress my drum, my, my, you know, my drum rooms. I don't normally, to be honest, I don't really compress that much in general, um, on my direct sounds, but I, uh, it really just kind of gave the room more life when I blend them in, um, you know, kind of just give it a little bit more vibe. So let's get into it. Um, the first thing I like to do, uh, as you can see, I'll have all of my faders at zero. This is like my mix. I probably wouldn't have tracked it like this. There's a few deactivated plugins that I had on initially. Um, but I'll start with my overhead mics. <clears throat> That's kind of where I always go with. But I want to check phase and I want to check uh, snare relationship in the left and right channels. So I really, really want the snare in the middle, also the kick, but mostly the snare. So I like to use this plugin uh, in phase from Waves. Um, just take it and uh, play it back, run the analyzer. Cool. So then I'm gonna go find the snare hit with this little uh, selector here. Get as close to zoomed in as I can. Um, right there where it starts to dip. And I, I normally wind up pulling one one direction or the other. I don't know, I tend to pull one closer. I don't think it really makes a difference either way. But now you can see that they're both essentially right in phase with each other. So the left and right sides, left and right mic are completely in phase. And then we'll just listen to it and check for the actual snare itself, the volume, and start to adjust gain. So I can tell right here that the snare is a bit louder on the left side than the right side. So I can pull down the left side just a hair. Trying to find that nice little middle ground to where it feels like it's in the middle. That feels nice. Cool. Um, so that's the overheads. I'll also tend to, I love this uh, Brainworks plugin, this control plugin, because I love the little mono maker under it. So what it'll wind up doing, <clears throat> I will grab this plugin and kind of pull everything up to like, probably like 150 or 200 and make all of that mono. So that kind of helps with keeping the snare in the middle a little bit more and also puts the kick in the middle all the time. So it doesn't really mess with anything above this specific frequency, so the symbols are still wide. I'm not doing any stereo expansion or stereo width manipulation, but really just keeping everything under it mono. Um, so I'll go through and I'll do that. Mono room, obviously that's one mic. Stereo room, I went through and did the same thing. Um, you know, this was already, I had already done this at one point. But I'll go ahead and check it one more time. Just make sure that it's as close to in phase as I can. I'd probably go for like the peak here, since it's a little hard to see the dip. And the peak, get it just right there in phase. Then listen to it, same thing, make sure the snare's in the middle. And then we'll run the same thing. We'll pull this Brainworks control plug in, kind of bring it up about to 230 again. Same thing, keeping that kick and snare in the middle, you know. Um, go to the stereo hall mic here, and check this one. Go to this uh, 
stereo hall mic here and check this guy out. Let's pull it back here. Cool. Um, just doing the same thing. And I know this is tedious, but like it's these little things that wind up making or breaking a drum mix for me. Um, you know, it's making sure that everything's perfectly in phase is what makes your drum mix sound good. Um, sounds bigger, sounds beefier. And it's, I know it's, you know, like I said, it's tedious, but it's really worth it. And that like this little bit of just extra love and care that you can put into it really makes a giant difference in the end. So with this one, the the left or the right side, I actually had recorded the Blum line incorrectly, so I had to flip phase on one of the sides. Um, I think I had one of them facing the opposite direction. Uh, rookie mistake, but you know it's an easy fix here if you can just flip the phase. Let me check the gain here. Make sure that it feels as close to in the middle as it can. Cool. And then we'll do the same thing with this control plug in here. Really just kind of make sure that it kind of feels like it's in the middle. And since this here, this track, um, this track is just the compressed version, the identical version of this track, I can essentially just copy this stuff over to right here and it'll do the same thing. So, so you can really kind of hear how much more compressed this one is it's got a much quicker attack a lot you know longer release it has a whole lot more sustain but it's essentially the same thing as this but we can just bring it down kind of act it make it act like a parallel compression on it um cool so the next thing i want to do is go through and check the direct mics for phase just to make sure you know everything's looking good um this kick here it seems like it's in phase this is a little bit after that the kick out is a little bit after the kick in and you could worry about that if you want um but just listen to it make sure that it feels good right now it actually feels really good if i take it and you know scoot it over i could totally do that just to get it right in phase at the very beginning of the attack A, B, it. Yeah, that feels good. I like it a little bit pulled forward. Um, we'll check the snare here. So the snare, um, this was the dry mic. This is the compressed mic. And then this is the bottom. I actually recorded the mic a little bit hot on the pre just to kind of get a little bit more body and length out of it. Um, it worked out for this, doesn't always work, but for like a Rocky stuff, it tends to sound really good. Also, there's a thing with phase. So if you are recording a drum, right? Um, and you're hitting it with a stick. So if there's a mic facing a drum head, like a batter head, and you're hitting it with a stick, the immediate thing that's going to happen is the head is going to go away from the stick and then come back. So in most instances, you would want the phase to go negative polarity and then come back positive polarity. That would be how it would be for the drummer actually playing. In a kick drum, it's going to go toward the mic first and then away from it. So it makes sense for a kick to have positive polarity at the beginning and a snare to have negative polarity at the beginning. And it kind of makes sense the same way for toms as well. You know, the negative polarity at the beginning tends to sound better than positive polarity at the beginning. If you go and make them positive, you're going to wind up having things out of phase in your overheads because your overheads are facing that same head, like batter head, just a little bit further away. Um, so, you know, I like to have the negative polarity on the snare drum. <clears throat> um, and I'm pretty sure I flip polarity on this snare bottom mic on the way in because that would be the opposite of the top where the sound is coming towards the mic first and then away. So to keep it in phase, 
I went ahead and flipped the polarity on the snare bottom mic just to make it a little bit bigger. Um, now, as far as the snare mic in the overhead track, that's the next thing where you want to check, you know, here's the positive polarity. You want to go to where the snare is positive in the overhead mic, which is right here. Go back and check and make sure that it's positive on the snare mic. They don't have to line up with the first positive because you need that distance here between them to get the length from the snare drum. It's obviously going to take longer for the audio to hit a mic that's further away. So you can see the drums the drum rooms are actually like even further behind because it's taking longer for that audio to get there. So <clears throat> we're positive in the overheads. We're good. Um, we can check. I'm going to probably leave this mono room uh, for a little bit of a later thing because I don't know if I want to focus more on the snare in this or the kick in this. Obviously the kick is out of phase in this. Um, it could sound good highlighting the snare in phase, or it could sound better highlighting the kick in phase. But normally with this mono room mic, I'm going to really mess it up. I'm going to really crush it with either compression or distortion just to kind of get a little bit of a vibe out of it. Not so much keeping it clean. Um, cool. So let's go ahead and grab a quick fader mix for these. Make sure they all feel good. I have everything pre-panned based on uh, drummer perspective. So your hi-hat's on the left, rack tom a little bit on the left, floor tom on the right. Um, and that's the way the overheads were recorded in stereo as well. So let's just get a quick fader mix. feels pretty good um one thing that i really like to do um in my template that i have set up all the time is i have a uh, you know pre design uh pre designated areas for each drum that already have my parallel compression sends on them so i don't ever really do compression directly on a drum track um i do it in parallel usually uh and i don't even do it on this these groups here so um what I'll go ahead and do is take these kicks, send them to my kick bus. Same with all these snares, send them to this snare bus. Uh, toms will go to toms. I've put the hi-hats, any kind of spot mic along with my overhead mics in my overhead. So if there's a ride mic, a china mic, that would go in the overheads as well. Uh, and then all the room mics go to my room bus. <clears throat> So let's listen to that real quick. So now I have a bit more separation. Everything's gonna go through my mix bus. And my immediate thing that I do, I have a pull tech here. This is an external piece of gear. Um, it's a stereo pull tech, but it has a really, really large um, wide boost at the top, of, like the highest of the range, almost all the way. And then it has a slight low boost down all the way at the bottom. I think either 20 or 30 hertz. So it's really just going to kind of scoop everything out and give everything like a little bit of a more uh, kind of playing with that Fletcher Munson curve, kind of giving everything a little bit more life. Cool. Everything seems a little bit more lively. Some of the mids are scooped out, but it feels nice. Um, Cool, so I'm just gonna pull my over. So all of these buses here for my individual mics, along with these parallel buses are going to a drum bus, which then in turn goes to a two bus, then a mix down and then a loud. Obviously that sounds like kind of redundant, but like when you're dealing with, um, you know, printing a bunch of different mixes at once, it makes it way easier to um, print, you know, mastered unmastered instrumental acapella all kinds of stems with just one pass of the song especially when you're using outboard gear like this and you don't want to have to sit there and play the whole song multiple times so 
that's the little bit of reasoning behind my template. I'll probably do a video later on how I have my template set up for certain reasons. Um, but for now, at least you can see, you know, why I'm kind of doing some of the things I'm doing. Uh, cool. So pull this down so we're not clipping. And I'll probably go ahead and pull down just these direct mics, just a little, these groups. So from here on out, aside from gating directly, I'm not going to mess with any of these direct mics anymore unless something happens and I need to do some frequency dependent EQing or like certain EQing on certain things. Um, I kind of try to like leave it as raw as I can um, and then affect the whole drum. So um, maybe the next best thing to do would be go through in Cubase. There is an option here to um, do hit point detection. So this is really important because I don't like to just put a gate on a drum track. Every hit you can see here has a total has a, a totally different transient um, and that can affect the gate in a different way the bleed can affect the gate in a different way. So what I like to do is make a hit point for every single drum hit, um, convert that to MIDI, and then convert that into an audio blip. Um, so if you're on Cubase, you can you know go into your hit point detection, edit hit points, check your threshold, go through, and just solo this. Just listen through the whole thing. Make sure that every single hit that is actually a kick drum here. So is getting a hit point. This is a snare, press shift, you can turn that off. And if you, it seems like there's too much of that, you can pull your threshold back a little bit. Um, and just go through, make sure everything is as close to the transient as you can get it. Obviously you don't need to like zoom all the way in here and like pull it right here. That's just a lot. Um, just, you know, visually make sure it's really close. Um, a lot of times, you know, when there's a lot of faster hits, like right here, the hit point detection will wind up being a little off and you just kind of got to double check it. Um, so go through, check all of these, make sure no snares, no toms are getting triggered and it's just kicks. And then you can go to create MIDI note. This little thing will pop up here. I like to make it C1 just because I'm used to like MIDI drums. Keep it at the dynamic velocity, hit OK. So then you'll have a MIDI track that'll pop up. So you'll go through, you'll do that for your kick and your snare. Since I already cleaned the toms, I'm probably not gonna do it for toms unless it was like a really tom heavy song. Um, and I knew I was gonna sample replace the toms, but with this, I'm probably not gonna do that. So you have all your kick stuff here. Uh, initially the MIDI would come in with the velocity probably way down here so I like to pull the velocity up just a fair bit so it's a little bit more even but not remove all of the humanization from it um, same thing on this snare track because I know that there's a lot of little ghost notes in here that are really important that don't need to be at full velocity so I'll take this I'll create a sampler track And then I'll just go into, you know, grab whatever, some random sample that I have. Really no big deal, as long as it's got just like a little bit of a transient on it. You know, probably a snare, something that's just not, you know, obviously not a, a cymbal or something. But something that's probably a snare, percussion, some kind of little click. That'll work great. Drop it into here. We're going to pull the beginning of this really far up so that when we're tr triggering, we're just getting a click. So you have this. You're going to want to do a fixed velo uh, fixed pitch, one shot, and monophonic. So you're not dealing with the, the sampler changing the notes of your pitch or anything like that based off whatever. Put your MIDI here, and then I like to just do a quick um, render which is cool because you can just hit in Cubase. You can just go up here, go to render in place, render with current settings, and then you'll wind up with these. So this is that audio blip just rendered. 
So you can see every single one of these on this track corresponds to a kick hit. Same with this for snare hits. So <clears throat> the first thing I like to do uh, in Cubase, you can do this thing where you can solo safe these. Um, so they're always playing. Pull the fader down. And I just have it set to no output because I don't really want to hear the clicks. Um, overall, there's really no point in hearing that. It's just going to sound really gross. Um, so the first thing I'll do is go up to my kick track, pull up a Fab Filter Pro G. We'll solo this kick. We'll go into the sidechain function and we'll use the sidechain of our new kick spike track. We'll go down here to the expert setting and change it to the external sidechain and we'll play it back. Oh, gotta make sure it's pre fader because our fader is turned off for the spike. So now the only information that this gate is getting is from our spike. So it's constantly the exact same information. So what we'll do is we'll make our attack really fast. We'll pull the release back until we actually have like enough of the kick coming through without any of the extra bleed. That sounds nice. So we'll go through and we'll do that with the kick out as well. Copy that over, double check our side chain, make sure it's pre-fader. And we'll listen to this as well. This one will have a fair bit more bleed in it because it's a large diaphragm condenser outside the kick. So obviously it's gonna have a little bit more cymbal. So there, we have a perfectly gated kick. And then we'll go through and we'll do that to our three snare mics really quickly with our snare spike. And then we'll go through, we'll do that to the same things with our three snare mics with our snare spike. Make sure it's pre-fader, set it to external. Super fast attack. With the snare, I like to do a little bit of a look ahead. So we're getting the same information every time. So you can tell that it's kind of taking a little bit of the ring away from the snare drum. So we'll pull this back. feels nice. And since this is just the compressed version of that same mic, I can probably essentially do the exact same thing. Just double check our spike. Nice. And let's check the bottom here. Cool. So now we're fully gated. Uh, obviously our toms are cleaned, like I said earlier, so there's really no need to gate the toms. Got a lot of room going on, so I'm just gonna pull that room mic down. So I can hear a little bit more of what's going on um, on the direct mics. So one thing I like to do, I, it's kind of unnecessary, there's, uh, so the TMT uh, console emulation inside the Plugin Alliance plugins, I really like having that little bit of like, it's not true analog summing, but it just gives everything like a little bit of a like more life when you have it on different channels. Um, honestly, I could turn it off. It probably wouldn't make that much of a difference, but I have that, this API console on all of these group buses and they're all on different channels. Um, but nothing's actually going on on them. I'm not using them for EQ. I'm not using them for compression or anything like that. They're literally just there for a vibe uh, to give it a little bit more, you know, movement. So first thing I'll do is look at this kick track. A lot of mid build up here. Do a little bit of a mid scoop. 
And I, this is like kind of not necessarily the best thing, but in rock music, it kind of makes sense to do a little bit of a high pass up to like 30. Uh, and I always low pass everything. Like you don't really need any of this information up here. Um, this scoop, we can find kind of like, you know, go around and find the best place for where the scoop needs to be. We might go back and adjust the scoop later. There's this weird little spike right here at like 120 hertz. Kind of pull that out a little bit. So it still sounds a little bit dull. You know, it doesn't sound great. Um, but then that's where Saturn 2 comes in here. So I have one crossover point in Saturn 2 here. And what I'm going to do is just turn up this warm tape only on the top end. I leave it default down here on the bottom. With the top end, I'm gonna add a little bit of drive and I'm gonna turn up this band. Get a little bit of that smack. So, and I can tell that I have a little bit too much snare coming through, so I'm gonna go back to my gate, pull down these releases just a little bit. Yeah, that feels good. Cool. So there's a kick for now. Let's check the snare out. It's the same general approach for the snare drum. Um, you know, we're not we're, we're not going crazy here. We're gonna high pass up to about a hundred. There's really this snare was tuned pretty high, so there's not a whole lot of information below a hundred, but there is a pretty gnarly ring. Gonna do a little bit of a low pass here down to about 12k. So the first thing I'll attack is this hiss, like hissy section here. Kind of just pull a little bit of that out because we don't really need all that. Um, another thing that I do, I don't really do much boosting on my Pro Q, um, on my equalization in general. I like to boost with saturation to really uh, make things more dense and add a little bit of length versus just boosting with an EQ. Um, so I see this ring here at about 500, 550. Just gonna kind of cut that out a little bit because we don't need all of that. A nice little ring is cool, but don't really need all of that. Kind of has like a few octaves of it too. Pull that out. So we can actually go in here and check our level balance. We'll just come back and look. That's looking pretty nice. That's sounding pretty good too. So we'll do the same thing here with Saturn 2 as well. Uh, the one crossover point. We'll just add a little bit more of this tape saturation to the top end to kind of smear that transient. Make it a little less pokey. And we can also use it here on the lower end of the snare to add a little bit of weight. Cool. So let me go to a section where we have some toms. We'll just cut this here and loop it. So we'll solo these toms here. Uh, normally, I'm I'm pretty good at making sure the toms are really well tuned, so I don't really have like a weird mid build up in anything. So I'll tend to just put this pull tech on my bus, um, boost a little bit of 5k and attenuate around 10. Doing the same thing the Pro-Q would normally do, kind of, but just with a pull tech to give it a little bit more warmth and boosting a little bit of 100 hertz. And well, it'll go to kind of, yep, see, already it kind of just like brings them right into life. Those KSM-32s really sing on toms too, so just puts them right in the pocket where they need to be. So another thing I'll do with toms is I'll pull up Spectre. This is my favorite plugin of all time, and I'll probably wind up using it a fair bit more on some of the other drums, but I wanna add a little bit of like 2.5K saturation. I also wanna add a little low end weight. Sounds really great. Cool. 
So let's go to the overhead mic real quick. Let's check what we got here. Probably gonna wind up sucking a little bit of the um, low end out of this. Oh, let me kill my loop. So this is the only spot with like an actual crash in it. Most of it's hi-hat. So I'm just gonna kinda find that ringing frequency. And I kind of like want to do like a little bit of a wide bell here. Pull it down just a hair. So there's a lot of low end going on here. I'm probably going to high pass up to a fair. Get rid of some of that kick. And then just get rid of a little bit of that. Rid of a little bit of that snare mid presence. Doesn't really need it. I like having the smack of the snare in there, but I don't really need all that low mid weight. All right, so let's check our rooms out. So it seems like our rooms are actually <laughs> uh, opposite of our overhead. So let's figure out which one it is that feels like the crash is on the left side. And then let's do a little quick flip. Pull out. This is one of my favorite plugins ever. Panipulator. Super simple, just lets you flip left and right real quick. That tend to fix that real quick, so let's check these. That kind of had the same problem. So we'll just throw that on all these room tracks. Make sure that that crash is really on the left side. Well, now we kind of have hi-hat on the right. We'll have to find a happy medium here. You know, I might just deal with it. There's only one spot where the crash is really happening on this song, so maybe it'll actually be cool for it to feel a little bit more wide. So one thing I'm gonna do with these rooms, this is something that I tend to do a lot. May not be the smartest idea sometimes. In certain situations, it just does not work. But you know, for heavier rock stuff, I really like the rooms to sing around the mids. I don't really want them to sing up top. There's really no point in them singing, you know, above like 5K. So I'm gonna filter. But I like to filter with like a pretty low octave or DB octave shelf and take out a little bit of that super low. And so I'm not like fully, you know, telephoning these out, but I'm really getting rid of some of that like crash cymbal sizzle and stuff like that. I'm gonna kind of pull a little bit of this low mid, like 300 Hertz stuff out. And then back to my favorite plugin ever, Spectre. Now we're gonna use this to really bring everything out. We're gonna unsolo this. Really listening for the snare here. Let's change it to tube mode. I actually liked it a little bit better on solid. Let's add a little bit of low mid weight here. Yeah, that feels nice. Cool, so there's our initial mix. You know, no compression happening at all. Um, but now let's add in a little bit of weight from compression. So this is my parallel compressor chain, uh, the kick snare chain. This is literally just the kicks and snare direct mics. Um, I'm hitting it with a DBX, really just trying to make both of them hit around 10 dB, you know, just get a really nice, solid, like disgusting compression happening here. I'll blend this in here, kind of get a little bit more smack. Also really helps those ghost notes sing a little bit. So the second channel here is everything else besides the kick and snare. Um, 
you know, this is overheads, this is rooms, this is toms, and this isn't necessarily a compressor. It does compress, but it's more of a tape emulator. So I'm really using the warmth function here to kind of take out a lot of that whole like top end sizzle thing. And I'm really not hitting it that hard. So this is really just the overheads and rooms coming in, barely doing anything, but it's gonna kind of like double up on it a little bit. Just kind of giving those rooms, those overheads a little bit more life than they had before. Let's go back to that session with uh, the Tom Phil and the crash. See, now we're working a whole lot harder because that, that warmth section is really cutting down on that crash. So this is the devil lock. This is the last of the parallel chains. And this is literally only on the snare drum. I like to take this thing and crush it. Um, I think it sounds super great on snare drums, but not directly on it. It has to be in parallel because you're really adding a lot of darkness onto it. It's really kind of doing a low pass, but it is crunchy and it sounds great. And it's literally just the snare drum. It's the only thing going into this. It's gonna sound ridiculous if you turn it up. But God, listen to that weight it adds. Sounds great. So the first thing that I'm starting to notice is like, you know, when we add a bunch of compression, the one thing that's really happening is we're kind of murdering our transients a little bit. Same with saturation, um, you know, Saturn, Spectre, stuff like that. It just, it, it kind of crunches away on your transients and you lose a little bit of that bite that you had before that, you know, I kind of miss. Um, I love the weight. I love the depth, but I just want a little bit more of that bite. So I'm going to go ahead and hit these with a transient designer. Uh, this Neutron Transient Shaper is absolutely my favorite one. I feel like it's the best one, you know. The SPL one's cool. There's a bunch of transient designers out there, but this one absolutely just, so far, you know, in 2021, this one has just been the best. So this is going to be on the kick. We're just going to add a little bit of this transient back. Maybe pull back a touch of this sustain. And I'm also starting to hear that this this devil lock is really kind of crunching down on those ghost notes and making them sound a little unnatural. So I'll probably pull this back a little bit. Kind of boost a little bit more room, a little bit more overhead. Cool, our kick's sounding good. So let's go ahead and do the same thing to our snare. The snare needs a fair bit more transient than the kick did. Pull down some of that sustain. Nice. Uh, toms, I don't really think they need that much more transient, but um, really wouldn't hurt. spot there we go so now we're clipping a little bit on the tom so we can go ahead and do a little bit of uh if we're clipping we might as well just put a clipper on it clippers really kind of help tom sing a little bit more especially when there's a whole mix going on So one last thing that I feel like I could do, I can move this transient shaper down and do another stage of saturation on this kick and snare. 
and I'll probably pull Spectre again. Um, really to just kind of add a little bit more low end to the kick drum. It's not like it doesn't have enough already, but like a, just a little bit down at like the 60-ish. Just because I know it's probably going to need it when there's bass and all kinds of other things in there. And just a little bit of bite around the 3K region. Sounds nice. So we can do the same thing with the snare here. I kind of want a little bit more top end out of the snare and maybe a little bit more bottom. Um, really just scooping the mids a little bit without actually scooping mids and just kind of doing it with saturation. So we'll add a little bit of 5K in here. That already sounds way better. And then let's just add like a really pretty tight 250-ish. So that's pretty much my drum mix. Um, everything will obviously get a fair bit louder and beefier when you know, you've know you added a bunch more of like, see, I don't really do much two bus compression. We can get into that a little bit. Really just gonna kind of like turn this on, bite down on the low end a little bit. Leaving that top end alone. Pulling the shadow hills up, really just gonna get this is the two bus compressor I tend to use. I'm not gonna use this optical thing at all. Um, really just gonna kinda get a little, like 0.5 dB here. Just adds a little bit of grabby to it. Um, Gulfoss, this thing's cool. You know, really just kinda helps tame out a little bit of what you had adds a little bit of movement there uh that it didn't have before um oxford inflator kind of does that scoop thing again and then we'll pull our uh our clipper and our limiter after our clipper And there we go. Well, thank y'all so much if you watched this whole thing. I don't really know what I'm doing when it comes to this whole YouTube thing, but I'm trying to give it a shot. So uh, yeah, this has been my video on drums. I'm sure I'll do a bunch more in the future. And thanks for watching.